free training provided by the HVAC School Podcast is made possible because of the generous support from our sponsors, Testo, Rector Seal, and Carrier. The Testo 773, in addition to the features on the other meters and the Testo 770 series, includes real-time power measurements, watts, power factor, and Bluetooth. The Testo app can be used for remote viewing, monitoring, data logging, and creating reports. This powerful app allows you to create custom reports that include photos, data, and graphs that can be saved or sent via email. Find out more by going to testo.com or visiting truetechtools.com. As always, you can get a great discount by using the coupon code GETSCHOOLED at checkout. Meet Zoomlock, the 10-second flame-free refrigerant fitting from Parker. Reduce labor costs by 60% with no brazing, no flame, and no fire spotter. Discover how Zoomlock can help you be more efficient and productive. Visit zoomlock.com for more information. The podcast host you turn on when you're having a hard time getting to sleep. Brian Orr. Hey, this is the HVAC School Podcast. I'm Brian Orr. This is the podcast that helps you remember the things about the HVACR industry that you may have forgotten or some of the things that you forgot to know in the first place. So today in the podcast, we're focusing on the H side of the HVACR, that is H4 heating. And this episode, I just have to give full credit here. This is all out of the brain of Dan Hollihan because I've told you many times I'm not a steam or hydronics guy at all. Certainly not an expert in those areas. So this is Dan Hollihan's steam heating primer that he wrote originally for heatinghelp.com. And so uh, Aaron Hollihan generously allowed me to republish it on HVAC school, HVACRschool.com. But you can find the original at heatinghelp.com, steam heating primer. And this is just me going through and narrating Dan's article. So here we go. A steam heating primer. If you ask a dozen people what the proper operating pressure for a steam system is, you'll probably get a dozen different answers. Most folks just follow what they were taught without giving much thought to the results. You see, most steam systems run at ridiculously high pressures. As early as 1900, residential boiler manufacturers decided that no house heating steam system should operate at a pressure higher than 2 PSI. They could make this statement because it's latent heat, not steam pressure, that does the actual heating work in a residential system. Latent heat is the energy we put into our water to get it to change state from liquid to gas. In the early 1800s, an Englishman named Thomas Treadgold coined the term British Thermal Unit. He defined the BTU as the quantity of heat needed to raise the temperature of one cubic foot of water one degree Fahrenheit. After he died, folks changed the cubic foot to a pound, which is about a pint of water. They could do that because Mr. Treadgold was just making it up. For instance, suppose we had one pint of 32 degree water. As a side note, water can exist as a solid or a liquid at 32 degrees. Did you know that? If we wanted to raise that pint of water to 212 degrees, we would have to add about 180 BTUs of heat. That would give us one pint of water, not steam, at 212 degrees. You see, water can also exist as a liquid or gas at 212 degrees. But how do we get that pint of water to change state and become steam? We do it by adding a great deal of latent heat. You know the old saying, a watched pot never boils? Well, it's certainly true because to make that pint of water turn to steam, we have to add 970.3 BTUs. Think of it. It only took 180 BTUs to get that pint of water to raise from 32 degrees to 212, but it took more than five times the heat, 970.3 BTUs, to get it to move from 212 degree water to 212 degree steam. There was no change in temperature, but there sure was a change in the energy content. This energy is latent heat and it's what heats the house. We get nearly all of it back when the steam condenses in the radiators. Steam can heat when it's at zero PSI pressure. You see, you don't need a lot of pressure to heat the building. All you need is latent heat. To prove this is true, consider this. If you add only 10 more BTUs of latent heat per pound of steam to zero PSI steam, you wind up with steam at 10 PSI. That 10 additional BTUs is insignificant when it comes to heating the building, but it can cause us many problems with the system, as you'll see. The job of steam pressure is strictly to overcome the friction that steam meets as it works its way around the system. All we have to do is supply enough back pressure back at the boiler to overcome the steam piping's friction. And that pressure you need is remarkably low, because years ago, 
fitter size pipe to offer very little resistance to steam flow. In fact, we measure this pressure in ounces per 100 foot of piping. This is why boiler manufacturers decided so many years ago that all you need is 2 PSI to operate any house heating system. Raising the pressure higher than 2 PSI will only cause you problems, because steam is a gas. When you raise the pressure of a gas, you compress it. Just think about what happens when you put air in your car's tires. Steam is a gas, just like air. When you compress it, it will naturally take up less space. The amazing thing is, it also begins to move more slowly. It's not as large, so it can afford to move more slowly. Strange as it may seem, it takes longer for high-pressure steam to get out of the radiators than it does for low-pressure steam. Also, high-pressure steam, since it's more tightly packed, will call more water out of the boiler than low-pressure steam. This can lead to low water problems back at the boiler. Steam travels across a system because of a subtle difference in pressure. Besides friction, the fire in the boiler and the condensing of the steam in the radiators also leads to a difference in pressure throughout the system. The fire creates the initial pressure. Since all the air vents are open, the inside of the piping system is at atmospheric pressure, which is 14.7 pounds per square inch at sea level and different in other parts of the country. Steam begins to move from the higher pressure in the boiler to the lower pressure in the system. But as soon as it begins to move, it also begins to condense into water. This is because the pipes are cold and the steam is hot. When the steam condenses into water, it leaves a partial vacuum in its place. The condensing process causes this vacuum. This is a fine point you've probably never thought about. Steam occupies about 1,700 times the volume of water. That means if you filled an 8-ounce glass with water and boiled it, you would have 1,700 8-ounce glasses available to catch the steam. A pint of water, once boiled, balloons out to fill a cubic yard. It's like popcorn. This also means that when steam condenses in the radiators, it will shrink to 1 1,700th of the space it occupied as steam. What we're left with, as long as the air vents remain closed, is a partial vacuum. This is good because it makes the steam travel where you need it up in the radiators. This is why you don't need pumps to move steam. All you need is a subtle difference in pressure. Now think about this. As the radiator heats, the condensing rate in that particular radiator will slow, right? In fact, it'll eventually reach a point where very little steam is condensing. The metal will have reached the steam temperature, the room will have reached the setting of the thermostat. It's nature's job to equalize temperature as well as pressure. And this is also a fine thing because it allows the steam to travel on to the next radiator down the line. The boiler's job is simply to get steam, a gas, out of the last radiator before it turns into water, a liquid. If the boiler is too small for that task, the building will be partially hot and partially cold. If the boiler is too small for that task, the building will be partially hot and partially cold. You'll wind up with problems. You see, when you're working with steam heat, you're really watching a race between the steam and the cold pipes. If the boiler is properly sized, the steam will win that race. This is why we size replacement steam boilers by measuring the radiators. As strange as it may seem, the heat loss of the building is not important. Only the race matters. We have to fill the steel balloon, the piping system, with steam before it can condense into water. As far as the replacement boiler is concerned, it doesn't matter if the homeowner insulated every nook and cranny and replaced all the windows in the house. If the piping and the radiators are there, you will have to fill them with steam. It's as simple as that. Don't make the mistake of sizing the new boiler by taking the information off the old boiler. The person who did that sizing may have been wrong, or someone may have removed or added radiators over the years. Don't take the chance. Do it right. And keep in mind, too, that there's a safety factor. You have to add to the net radiation load to allow for the heating of the pipes. We call this the pickup factor. Nowadays, we allow an additional 33%. Years ago, that safety factor was much larger. So when we size a replacement steam boiler, the age of the system also matters. So, when sizing a replacement steam boiler, the age of the system also matters. This pickup factor is the difference between the net ratings, the actual radiant load, and the DOE heating capacity rating, the radiators in the pipes. The firing rate of the boiler should match the DOE heating capacity rating of the system. That's piping plus radiation. Let's take a look at some of the other changes manufacturers have made to boilers in recent years. As boilers became smaller and the piping around them became more and more important, Today's replacement steam boiler contains much less water than the boilers of yesteryear, and yet the new boiler produces just as much steam as the old boiler. Modern oil boilers and improved boiler design make this possible. But if you want that job to be successful, you have to pay careful attention to the boiler manufacturer's near boiler piping specifications. Ignore them at your own risk. The purpose of the piping specification is to give you a boiler that delivers dry steam. Dry steam contains a great deal of latent heat. 
If you add even a little moisture to the steam by piping the boiler incorrectly and letting water leave the boiler with the steam, the latent heat content of the steam will suffer. The steam, in essence, will condense in the moisture before it has a chance to reach the radiators. In short, the steam will lose the race to the last radiator and parts of the building will be cold. And not only will the building heat unevenly, the fuel consumption will also increase because the pressure troll will never reach its high limit. And to make things worse, you'll probably also have water hammer. That's the knocking in the pipes that people who don't know any better think of as normal. Follow the boiler manufacturer's instructions to the letter, and you'll avoid most of the common problems associated with steam. Here are a few of the things the boiler manufacturer will tell you to do. Allow at least 24 inches between the top of the boiler and the bottom of the steam header. Use full-size risers to the header. Pipe the system takeoffs at a point between the last riser to the header and the equalizer. Pipe the swing joints into the header. Use a reducing elbow to connect the header to the equalizer. You'll probably also see a section on how to clean the boiler after you've worked on it. There's really no way around this. All steam boilers must be cleaned after they're installed. You don't necessarily have to do it immediately, but you have to do it. It often pays to let the system run for a few days before you go back to give it a good cleaning. Waiting a few days gives the oil and dirt a chance to settle on the surface of the water. There are many opinions on the best way to clean a steam boiler. One of the oldest ways is to dissolve a pound of trisodium phosphate, TSP, and a pound of caustic soda, lye, in the water and pour it in the boiler. Let it cook for a few hours and then drain the boiler. If you can't buy TSP in your town, try a commercial soap called MEX. It works well and won't damage the rubber gaskets found in some boilers. However, before you clean any boiler, check the manufacturer's instructions for their recommendations. Skimming the boiler is the best way to remove surface oil. You'll know there's oil in the boiler if you see any moisture at all in the gauge glass above the water line. Many technicians are tricked into believing the water is clean just because it appears to be clear in the gauge glass, but they're in for a surprise because oil can be colorless in boiler water. The part of the gauge glass above the water line should be bone dry. It should look like someone just ran a dish towel through it. If you have a surging water line and there's moisture in the gauge glass, try cold skimming the boiler. You do this by opening a horizontal tapping above the water line and installing a 6 inch nipple. Open the feed water line slowly until the water level rises to the center of the nipple and spills out. Don't be in a hurry, if you rush you'll be skimming from below the surface of the water and accomplishing nothing. Let the water slowly run from the skim port for several hours. Check it periodically by taking a sample of the water and boiling it on the customer's stove in a small pot. If there's oil in the water, the water will foam when it boils. Keep skimming and checking until your sample boils like tap water. That's when you know you're done. Remove the nipple and start the boiler. In most cases, your surging problems will become just a bad memory. Skimming from the top of the boiler doesn't work as well because rising water will cling to the metal before it has a chance to get out of the boiler. Draining from the bottom of the boiler doesn't work as well as horizontal skimming either for the same reason. Firing a small boiler while skimming is ineffective because the surface oil will be emulsified in the water. Just think about what happens to the oil you add to a pot of boiling water before you drop in that pound of spaghetti. Oil doesn't stay on the surface when the water is boiling. This is especially true in a high efficient, low water content boiler. Cold horizontal skimming works pretty well most of the time if the boiler has been up and running for a while. Now let's take a look at several different types of steam systems. One pipe steam. One pipe steam takes its name from the single pipe that connects each radiator to the steam main. Both steam and condensate travel in this pipe, but in opposite directions. This is what often makes one pipe steam so difficult to manage. When the steam and condensate travel in opposite directions, what we call counterflow, you have to pay close attention to the size and pitch of the pipes. For instance, when steam and condensate move in the same direction, that's parallel flow, the pitch should be at least 1 inch and 20 feet. When there's counterflow, however, the pitch must be at least 1 inch and 10 feet. See? It doubles. The exception to this is when you have a horizontal run out to a radiator riser. Here the pitch should be at least 1 inch per foot. Where you can't get this pitch, or where the horizontal run out is longer than 8 feet, you have to go to the next size pipe. The rules are fairly simple, but few people take the time to learn them. That's why you wind up with so many radiators that bang, and so many air vents that split. If you're adding or removing radiators, get some advice from a reputable supplier of steam specialties. They'll be able to help you out with the pipe sizing and pitch. Let's take a look at the basic controls on a one pipe and two pipe system. The pressure troll determines the operating range of the boiler during the heating cycle. It's important to understand that a heating boiler doesn't make steam all the time. It only does that when the thermostat clicks on. During a call for heat, the boiler will cycle up 
and the cutout setting of the pressure trawl. At that point, the pressure trawl will shut off the burner. Some pressure trawls show the cutout setting as differential. Usually you'll add that differential to the cut-in setting to get the cutout setting. Be careful though, because some pressure trawls show differential as a number to be subtracted from the cutout setting. Take a few minutes to read the instructions and think about what the manufacturer is telling you. When the pressure trawl reaches its cutout setting, steam will be moving out into the system and condensing in the pipes. This condensing process will cause an overall drop in system pressure. When the system cycles down to the cut-in pressure trawl setting, the pressure trawl will restart the burner as long as the thermostat is still calling for heat. If the thermostat isn't calling for heat, the burner will remain off and the steam pressure will drop to zero, atmospheric pressure. Usually, you should set the pressure trawl to turn the burner on at one half PSI and off at the lowest possible pressure required to heat the furthest radiator. If that pressure winds up being more than two PSI, something's wrong. Most likely, the air vents aren't working properly. Years ago, fitters used vapor stats to control the boiler. These are like pressure trawls, but they're much more sensitive. A vapor stat measures pressure in ounces. They're still available today, but they're more expensive than pressure trolls. Nevertheless, along with quality air vents, a vapor stat is probably the best investment you can make. You see, when it comes to steam, low pressure is the key to success. If you're concerned about the burner because it's short cycling, look to the air vents, not the pressure troll. Main vents are the key here. Get rid of the air and the building should heat without short cycling. Commercial boilers also require a manual reset, high limit pressure trawl to shut off the burner should the pressure rise too high. Make sure you install this with the operating pressure trawl, but not on the same pigtail. Speaking of which, you pipe the pressure trawl to a steam pigtail so you'll have a water seal between the control and the boiler. The water protects the control from the steam temperature and extends its life. Obviously, you shouldn't have a valve between the boiler and the pressure trawl. If the pigtail clogs, which it will, replace it with a new one. If your burner is short cycling, it may be because the pigtail is clogged. Check it out. The relief valve protects the boiler against a runaway fire. On space heating steam boilers, the relief valve is set to pop at 15 PSI. This is the limit for any low pressure boiler. The relief valve should be rated by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME for short and you should size it for the maximum load of the boiler. For safety, pipe it to a drain or within a few inches of the floor. It's not a good idea to pipe the relief valve to outdoors because should it pop off, water will be held in the pipe by vacuum, much as water is held in a straw when you put your finger over one end. During the winter, the trapped water in the relief line that's piped to the outdoors can freeze and block the escaping steam as surely as a pipe plug will. That's pretty dangerous. If you must pipe the relief valve to the outside, use a vacuum breaker at the discharge of the valve. This will allow the water to drain the water from the line after the relief valve has popped. It's best to avoid this altogether if you can though, and naturally, there should never be any valves between the relief valve and the boiler or the relief valve and the drain line. The low water cutoff is required by code. Its job is to shut off the burner should the water level fall to an unsafe point. The boiler manufacturer determines this level, but it's usually within one half inch of the bottom of the gauge glass. The low water cutoff can be a float type or a probe type. Probe type low water cutoffs are becoming very common on low water content boilers because these cutoffs have a timing device to prevent nuisance shutdowns should the boiler water surge. Probe type cutoffs send a low voltage charge through the water to ground on the boiler's metal. Don't use a probe control without first getting the boiler manufacturer's recommendations as to where they want it installed. Float type cutoffs mount directly to the gauge glass of the boiler and sense the movement of the water line mechanically. The low water cutoff manufacturer determines where the cutoff belongs. You should never tamper with these settings. Some installers try to make the boiler more automatic by raising the low water cutoff so that it covers the domestic water coil all year long. This, they think, will save the homeowners the trouble of raising the level by hand during the summer. But it's a bad idea because it also creates a normal water line that's several inches too high. It brings the boiler water too close to the steam outlet and drives water up in the system. Before you know it, you have more problems than you bargained for. Save yourself the headache and have the customer cover the tankless coil by hand once a year. The gauge glass is your way of knowing where the water is in the boiler. Expect to see some minor movement in the water line. Anything between half and three quarters of an inch up and down movement is normal. When the boiler is off, the normal water line is at the center of the gauge glass. When the system is running, the normal water line is near the bottom of the gauge glass. That's because the water in the form of steam and condensate is out in the system. When the burner shuts down, the level will return to the center of the gauge glass again. 
Don't try to keep the water in the center of the glass when the system's running, because obviously this will cause the boiler to flood when the condensate finally returns on the down cycle. Again, this is why you shouldn't tamper with the low water cutoff level. The automatic water feeder, if you're using one, is there to maintain a safe minimum water line. It's not there to help maintain a normal water line when the boiler's off. A water feeder will protect the system against freeze-ups if the people are away in the winter, and say an underground return should spring a leak. Without the feeder, the low water cutoff would shut down the burner and the house would freeze up. So while it's not essential to the system's operation, you can consider an automatic water feeder a useful backup safety device. In addition, a feeder will provide some convenience in an old system that's prone to leaks. The feeder will maintain an operating water level rather than have the burner shutting down daily on low water. If the customer doesn't want his leaking buried returns replaced, an automatic feeder makes a lot of sense, but naturally, a great deal of fresh feed water can also harm a boiler through oxygen corrosion. Think about this when you're advising the customer. Give them the facts and their options, then leave the decision to them. Let's take a minute now and define some terms. A wet return is any pipe that's below the water line. A wet return is any pipe that's below the boiler water line. A dry return is any pipe that's above the water line. The header is the large horizontal pipe directly above the boiler. You have to size it to carry the entire steam load of the boiler. Nowadays, the boiler manufacturer will often oversize the header so it acts as a point of low velocity. That gives the steam a place where it can slow down and dry out before it heads out into the system piping. Always check the boiler manufacturer's requirements on header size before you install a replacement steam boiler. You'll often find that the old header is too small for the new boiler. Risers are the pipes between the boiler and the header. They must be the full size of the boiler tapping. Don't reduce them because you'll cause the steam to move too fast. When that happens, the steam will pull some of the water out of the boiler and throw it into the system piping. Many of the newer boilers call for two or three risers on the header. The older boiler may not have needed as many. If you go with the old piping system and ignore the manufacturer's instructions for the new boiler, the new boiler's water line might wind up tilting at a severe angle. This can lead to a very wet steam, and in many cases, a broken boiler because the flame will be licking at the boiler's exposed crown. Without water to carry off the heat, a boiler can crack. If the boiler has more than one outlet, it's also important to remember to pipe the headers with swing joints. If you don't, the boiler sections can be split wide open like an accordion when the horizontal header heats and expands. If you have such a boiler with more than one outlet and swing joints, you shouldn't use copper instead of steel for the header. This is because copper expands twice as much as steel. That can cause the solder joints to come apart and leave your customer with steam leaks. Consider too that when you use copper in a steam system, there will be more corrosion than normal because of the dissimilar metals. Copper, steel, and iron lead to corrosion at the places where they come together. Takeoffs are the pipes connecting the header to the system. You probably won't be changing these. The original installer sized them to handle the connected loads. Sometimes someone adds radiation to the existing takeoff and you should watch for this because it can cause you a service problem. The takeoff might not be able to carry the additional heat on a cold day. Any reputable manufacturer of steam heating equipment will be able to check the size of the takeoff against the connected load and advise you. The boiler manufacturer determines the size of the equalizer. Its job is to return any water that slips out of the boiler with the steam and also to balance the pressure between the supply and the return size of the boiler. Without a properly sized equalizer, water can back out of the boiler. Never pipe a steam takeoff over the equalizer. The steam's velocity can create a pressure drop in the equalizer that will lift the water up, causing a corresponding drop in the boiler's water line. In 1919, the Hartford Steam Boiler Insurance and Inspection Company invented the Hartford Loop. Its job was to prevent water from leaving the boiler should a return line spring a leak. The connection between the loop and the equalizer must be made with a close nipple to prevent water hammer. This is because steam is forming in the loop connection. Returning condensate can cause this steam to rapidly condense and shrink to 1 1700th its steam volume. The water rushes in to fill the void. As the condensate slams against the back of the tea, you wind up with water hammer in the return. And this is also why you don't see main vents on many jobs. They're installed improperly and get damaged on the first few cycles. That's a shame because main vents are the key to good one pipe steam operation. If you're using good main vents near the ends of every main, steam will travel very quickly to every radiator in the building. Vent large radiators quickly and small radiators slowly, no matter where they are in the building. Focus on the air content of the radiator rather than its location in the building. If your main vents are working, steam will arrive at each radiator at about the same time. 
Baseboards over three feet long has no place in one pipe steam systems. In most cases, you can never get the pitch or size you need to keep the air vent from spitting water up to the ceiling. If you must use baseboard, connect it with two pipes, vent the outlet side, and drip the return pipe immediately into a wet return. Don't use a steam trap, just drip it into a wet return. Pitch the baseboard run toward the return as much as you can. Two pipe steam. Like one pipe, two pipe steam takes its name from the number of connections you'll find at the radiator. As heating jobs got larger in the old days, fitters found it made good sense to have just steam in one pipe and condensate in the other. That way, each pipe could be smaller and the pitch of the pipes became less crucial because everything was moving in the same direction. In a two pipe steam system, the steam connection is usually at the top of the radiator. The condensate connection is at the bottom on the opposite side, but this doesn't always have to be that way. You can also have the inlet and outlet at the bottom of the radiator, at opposite ends, or you can have the inlet at the top and the outlet at the bottom, on the same side of the radiator. At the turn of the century, there was a type of steam called the two-pipe air vent system. This system had two pipes and two supply valves at opposite ends of the bottom of the radiator. Since the system didn't use steam traps, they hadn't invented them yet, both pipes carried steam. It worked because of the air vents. One pipe was always larger than the other. The larger pipe was always on the inlet side of the radiator. When the steam traveled through the system, it favored the larger pipe because that's where the least resistance to flow was. But this was an expensive system to install because there were twice as many pipes as the one pipe system, and it offered an advantage only when the radiators were very large. With a large radiator, you have a lot of condensate flowing backward down the one pipe supply line. That can create water hammer. The two pipe steam system died an early death and has been obsolete for many years, but there are still many of them around. They were popular in municipal type buildings such as schools and courthouses. If you see two supply valves at the bottom of the radiator, you probably have one of these old systems. Be careful, this system is easily confused with true two pipe steam. However, it works differently and can cause quite a few problems should you make certain piping changes to the system. True two pipe steam uses thermostatic steam traps on the radiators. The steam trap has three jobs. It opens to let air pass through the radiator and into the return piping. Air is a great insulator. If left in the radiator, you'll have a cold room. Also, when water boils, it releases a great deal of carbon dioxide because of carbonates and bicarbonates that are common in fresh water. This carbon dioxide will travel through the system and mix with condensate to form a mildly corrosive carbonic acid. Naturally, this acid is harmful to the radiator and also to the returns. This is another reason why good main air vents are so important to the steam systems. You have to get rid of that carbon dioxide before it mixes with the condensate, so steam traps are actually air vents as well. The second job of the steam trap is to close when steam reaches it. Radiator steam traps have a thermostatic bellows. Manufacturers fill these bellows with a mixture of alcohol and water. They use alcohol because it boils at 170 degrees at atmospheric pressure, while water boils at 212. The alcohol-water mixture is usually set to boil at about 180 degrees. When the steam reaches the radiator trap, the alcohol flashes and expands the bellows. There's a pointed metal rod called a pin on the bottom of the bellows. When the bellows expands, it pushes the pin down into the trap seat. The trap is now closed and no steam can escape. With nowhere to go, the steam condenses and gives up its latent heat to the room. Should the bellows fail, a good deal of the steam will pass into the returns and heat the inside of the building's walls instead of the rooms where the people are. This is wasteful, noisy, and destructive to the condensate pump if you're using one, but a failed trap is hard to spot because the radiator will continue to heat. It won't look any different from the outside. The third job of the trap is to open once the condensate is cooled. The condensate will pass through the trap and flow downhill to the boiler. Most radiator trap elements have a lifespan of about three years. This is because the element flexes about 155,000 times per heating season. This near-constant movement combined with water hammer is what kills the elements. Unfortunately, most people check traps about once every 30 years. You can check radiator traps with a temperature-sensitive crayon called a template stick, or with a temperature probe. There should be about a 20 degree difference across an operating trap. The problem is that if one trap fails, the steam passing into the returns can trick you into thinking a nearby trap has also failed. It also helps to check the system backwards starting with a large return and working up toward the branches. This should reveal problem areas. Then it's just a matter of isolating radiators and checking them. True, it's time consuming, but it's also necessary. Steam traps also have a curious effect on the system's returns. Because they close to steam, traps prevent steam from getting into the returns. 
Remember what we said about the one-pipe system? Water returned to the boiler because of the static weight of the water and the leftover steam pressure at the end of the main. With two-pipe, you no longer have leftover steam because you put condensate back in the boiler. This is because of the traps. This means that the only force you can depend on is the static height near the boiler. With two-pipe steam, the dimension between the center of the gauge glass and the bottom of the lowest steam main must be at least 30 inches for every pound of pressure in the boiler. In other words, if you fire the boiler at 2 psi, you need 60 inches of height between the center of the gauge glass and the bottom of the lowest steam main. If you fire 5 psi, you need 12 and a half feet between those two points. It's another good reason to keep that steam pressure low, isn't it? This is why you'll often see condensate pumps being used on two pipe steam systems. The pump provides the pressure needed to put the condensate back in the boiler because the basement isn't deep enough to provide the returning condensate enough static weight. A condensate pump is the low point in the system. Everything must flow downhill to it. If any part of the system dips below the condensate pump inlet, you'll have water hammer shortly in the system. You'll have water hammer shortly after the system first starts up. A condensate pump has a receiver made of either steel or cast iron. Cast iron lasts much longer than steel because condensate is corrosive. This receiver is nothing more than a gathered chamber for returning condensate. It's vented to the atmosphere because for the most part, condensate receivers aren't rated to withstand any pressure. If you plug the receiver vent, the receiver can explode. Inside the receiver is an electrical float switch. This switch turns the pump on when the water level inside the receiver rises and off when it falls. On the discharge side of the pump, you'll find a check valve to keep the boiler water in the boiler and a throttling valve. The throttling valve is there to slow the pump down. You see, most condensate pumps will discharge at 20 PSI pressure. That's too high for most heating applications. It's not too high for commercial applications, however. The throttling valve will stop the check valve from chattering by adding resistance to the pump's pressure. You just crank the valve down until the noise stops. A condensate pump has no way of knowing if the boiler it serves needs water or not. When it fills, it dumps. It's just as simple as that. Because of this, boiler feed pumps are sometimes used in place of condensate pumps. This is especially true with modern, low water content boilers. Boiler feed pump is different because a float switch located on the boiler, not in the pump's receiver, controls the pump. With a boiler feed pump, the pump can only come on if the boiler needs water. The receiver on the boiler pump is also much larger than the condensate pump's receiver. This oversized receiver gives the condensate a place to wait until the boiler needs it. Be careful when you replace an old boiler on a two-pipe system with a new boiler. You may find that the old condensate pump isn't compatible with a new boiler. You may need a boiler feed pump. Hanging a storage tank on the side of the boiler is no substitute for a boiler feed pump. First of all, all the reserve water would have to be located within the three inches or so of boiling operating range. This leads to very long and very narrow tanks. But more important, that additional water would have to be brought to steam temperature on each firing cycle. The tank will typically contain about 125% of the water in the boiler. This kills the overall operating efficiency of the boiler and can cause the customer to use more fuel than he would have with his old boiler. When you're using a condensate or boiler feed pump, or when the two-pipe system has dry returns, you'll find float and thermostatic, or f and traps at the end of the steam mains. These larger traps keep steam from reaching through to the dry return piping. The thermostat and the f and trap is there strictly to pass air to the vent on the condensate pump. The condensate passes through the trap by lifting a float. This float is very similar to the ball cock in a toilet tank. The trap is normally closed. Steam can't pass through the trap when the ball is down because the lever attached to the ball is attached to the trap's pin, and that pin is firmly seated in the trap's outlet. Since steam can't escape, it will condense. It's this condensing steam that eventually raises the float ball and opens the trap. When the trap opens, the higher pressure on the trap's inlet pushes the condensate through the trap and into the return line. When the trap goes dry, the ball drops the pin back into the seat and keeps the steam from escaping. Because the trap is normally closed, it too will have an effect on the returning condensate. You'll need 30 inches of height between the trap and the center of the gauge glass for every pound of pressure in the boiler. That is, of course, unless you have a condensate or boiler feed pump supplying the return pressure. This is a good place to mention that motorized zone valves on the steam takeoffs have the same effect on the returning condensate as traps. You should never use them on a steam system unless you also use a condensate or boiler feed pump and f and traps. Since f and traps are mechanical devices, they're not sensitive to temperature. Thermostatic radiator traps are sensitive to temperature. 
there is no noticeable drop in temperature from one side of the F&T trap to the other. They discharge water at the same temperature as steam. Remember what we said about steam in the section about how steam heats. It can either be a liquid or a gas at the same temperature, right? The difference between the two is latent heat, and you can't measure latent heat with a thermometer. This is where things get a bit tricky because you can't check an F&T trap with a template stick or a temperature probe. There's no difference in the temperature across an F&T trap, even when the trap is operating. The only way to check F&T traps is to open a union or a valve on the discharge side and look at what comes out. If the trap isn't operating properly, there'll be several inches of invisible steam and then a plume of vapor. If the trap is operating, you will see only vapor and water. This is why it's a good idea to install new F&T traps with a drain valve and shutoff valve on the discharge side. These two valves make troubleshooting very easy. Most F&T traps fail because they're oversized. You should never size an F&T trap to match the line size. This causes the seat to withdraw and leak in no time at all. Trap sizing isn't difficult, but you do need to know how much condensate will be passing through the trap and at what pressures, both supply pressures and back pressures. Seek the advice of a reputable steam trap manufacturer if you're not sure what to do. In recent years, many older two-pipe steam systems have been retrofitted with non-electric thermostatic radiator valves. These valves sense the air temperature in the room and open or close the steam supply to the radiator. They're installed in place of the supply valve. Because no condensate travels down the supply pipe in a two-pipe system, you can throttle the supply valve without getting water hammer. These thermostatic radiator valves make the system more efficient because they prevent the radiator from overheating. They also compensate for outdoor heat sources such as sunlight, machinery, and people. Take your time and always keep in mind that all steam systems operate on the simple law of pressure differential. High pressure will always move towards low pressure, and those pressures are usually very subtle. It's as simple as that. Big thank you to Dan and Aaron Hollihan from HeatingHelp.com. If you have not been to HeatingHelp.com, I suggest that you go there sooner than later. You can pick up Dan's book, The Lost Art of Steam Heating or The Lost Art of Steam Heating Revisited by going to HeatingHelp.com. And obviously, this episode of the podcast was done just as a supplement to the podcast that I just did with Dan, just a deeper look at steam heating. Once again, I want to state Dan is the expert on this, not me. I'm reading his work, and you can find this article in its original form at heatinghelp.com, and I republished it with permission from Aaron and Dan on hvacrschool.com. So big thank you to them. If you're willing to, go to hvacrschool.com as well as bluecollarroots.com to see all of our podcasts. So thank you for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. If you have not listened to the other podcasts in the Blue Collar Roots Network, I would suggest going to bluecollarroots.com. One podcast that I'm going to mention here is the Building HVAC Science Podcast with Bill Spohn. Bill takes a really deep dive into some building science and HVAC design topics, test and measurement. You know, Bill has some great videos on his YouTube channel at True Tech Tools about taking airflow measurements, for example. He's just an expert in that area and building best practices. You're thinking about the envelope of the building as part of the HVAC system is, is really a new way that we're starting to think about buildings and structures and how to better engineer them. So the Building HVAC Science Podcast is a great way to learn more about that. And like I said, you can go to bluecollarroots.com and find all the different podcasts in the Blue Collar Roots Network. All right, so I've got James Bowman with me from Rector Seal, and I wanted to ask him real quick about the No Kink product. It's a pretty interesting and innovative product. So tell me about it, James. Well, this came out of a original conversations with contractors. We're talking about when they were roughing in or I'd make tight bends on in the back of mini splits into the wall. So it's a flexible stainless steel connector. They come in three foot and six foot lengths. It's made of corrugated stainless steel surrounded by I mean, my mind would like there was a 304L stainless surrounded by a stainless steel braiding with three inch copper stubs on both ends. You can sweat or flare or use a new fancy fitting to connect Makes your tight spins. We also, the six foot lengths guys are using them in refrigeration, beer boxes, replacing the pullouts that are constantly kinking and leaking. We also make the three footers up to seven eighths. You get a tight condenser somewhere. You made it make a sharp bend instead of having to solder in 245s and a 90. Solder in a no kink and bend it around and reconnect it to your unit. 800 PSI working pressure, 4000 burst. UL listed, good product. Besides the fact it looks really, really cool. It's made of stainless steel. Yeah, of course. Who doesn't like stainless? That is the No Kink Flexible Refrigerant Line Connector made by Rector Seal. 
So the other day, a friend of mine, he sent me an animated picture of a horse. I said I wouldn't even open it because I, you know, you should never look a gift horse in the mouth. (laughs) All right. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. Thanks for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.